Welcome to Cultivating Victory Live. We have a special guest here today, uh, Josh Tickell, who is actually a Sundance award-winning uh, filmmaker and has written several books and concentrates on some of the biggest issues of our time, things like climate change, social issues. His new book, Kiss the Ground, focuses on my favorite topic, soil, and how that can tie all these issues together. Um, if, if we fix our soil, fix our food, then a lot of other things that are wrong in the world start to fix themselves. And so we're really honored to have somebody of your caliber visiting our show, Josh, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to be talking to people of your caliber as well. It's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a big picture topic. I think it's easy for folks during this time to get so distracted with all the media noise that we have. You know, people are very focused on politics. People are very focused on what's not working in the world. Sometimes we forget to take a moment and think about what we can do to make things better. And that's really, I think, the, the crux of our conversation here today. Yes, absolutely. So tell us about Kiss the Ground. What's the book about and what inspired you to write it? Well, Kiss the Ground, you know, has been a long journey. It's, it's been a multi, multi, multi-year journey. I came out of college driving something called the veggie van, which is a van powered by vegetable oil, and ended up falling in with the biodiesel community. Wrote a couple books about that, ended up working for some of the larger conglomerates, agricultural conglomerates in the wor world, the soy and corn um, conglomerates in the U.S., as the kind of sustainability guy. And there was a mantra about saving the family farm. You know, everybody wanted to talk about saving the family farm, saving the American farmer. But everywhere that I went, farmers were going out of business in record numbers. And there was one constant, and that was the soil it was very poor quality. So there was crop blight, there was rust, there was all these major issues affecting hundreds of thousands of acres of farms across the country. And while the rhetoric was good, no one seemed to be doing anything about the underlying issues. So I paused that career and I went on and, and made films, um, but it always stuck in the back of my mind, you know, what are we going to do ultimately about our agricultural policy in the U.S.? So we, we uh, you know, this journey has not been a direct journey for me. My friends, a couple of my friends, Ryland Engelhart and uh, John Rulak. Ryland is from the family that runs Cafe Gratitude. John Rulak runs a company called Nutiva, which is a regenerative food company. They said, look, you should really make a movie about dirt. And I said, you know, I just made three movies about fuel. There's only one thing less interesting than fuel, and that's dirt. So you want me to, you want me to downgrade, you want me to go backwards. But, but you know, it, it harkened back to this time that I'd spent across America looking and working on farms and the more they talked and the more I looked at the new science, what, what had come out in the last really few years, um, the more I was just blown away. And I said, well, wow, this is the potential linchpin to so many of the issues that we are seeing in the world from climate to water to even terrorism. Really, when you look at the destabilization of the Middle East, of Northern Africa, it's due to lack of soil care. Uh, ultimately, that's the root, root, root cause. There are many other human dynamics happening, but soil care and the status of soil underpins so much of what's happening on the surface of our earth. So that was the you know, impetus to start this project. And it started as a documentary. It didn't start as a book. But three years on the road, hundreds of hours of footage, transcripts, I had to begin to distill that material down for the editors. And it, it actually, the book began as a series of notes for, for the editors of the film to give them a clarity and an understanding of the mountains of footage that they were doing. It's very, as you know, it can get kind of technical, a little bit boring. Right. So I wanted to find a way to, to engage the people working on the film. Uh, and sure enough, enough notes kind of made a book and, 
convinced my dear friend Zena Musica at Enliven uh, that this would make a great book. And of course, she started Zena's Teas, which was the first fair trade organic tea in the US. She got it immediately um, and said, let's do it. Let's put Kiss the Ground out as a book. So I was thinking about your title this morning, and I thought that had to be an attempt to make dirt sexy. Who came up with the title? Well, uh, you know, the title is actually pulled from a roomy quote. Uh, there are a hundred ways to uh, kneel and kiss the ground. There are a hundred ways to go home again. And so the quote's thousands of years old, um, and and he's a Sufi poet. But I think it, it you know, the Kiss the Ground nonprofit used Kiss the Ground first, and I've been working in conjunction with the Kiss the Ground nonprofit. The book is an extension of many of the philosophies that they teach. They're, they're an educational nonprofit. So I, I think it's a good mantra, kiss the ground. You know, let's humble ourselves and remember that's where we come from. That's where our food comes from. No ground, no humans. Very simple. You know, I, uh, my family has been in New Mexico for 16 generations. And so there's a lot of oral tradition that, that, because of the way the Spanish came into the Southwest, a lot of family history is lost or misrecorded or uh, it's hard to trace roots. But, uh, but you get all these oral histories coming down from your family. So I don't have any official tribal connections, but we were always told que los indios creen que, que la vida viene de la tierra, that the Indians believe the life comes from the earth. Mm. And, uh, and as a scientist, the more I studied soil, the more I realized they're right. <laughs> Life mm -hmm. comes from the earth. So I, I just find it um, incredible to look back at our history from that perspective, knowing what we know today about what's happening in the soil and think what it must have looked like to people when the Europeans arrived and began tilling the land and turning the dirt and changing that whole structure that we know brings life forth. Yeah, I mean, most traditional cultures have a reverence for soil. We, we don't. We, we have about as much reverence for soil as we do for you know, where does our electricity come from? Where does our water come from? We turn on the tap, water comes out, we hit a switch, light comes on, we go to the grocery store, there's food. It's all part of this kind of industrial magic that we find ourselves living in. Um, but when you get to know the earth and you get to know the soil, as, as you well know, uh, it is an infinite universe filled with incredible uh, incredible life and and has incredible possibility to change uh, where we're at as a society to make things better. So what do you see that change looking like? Well, I think we're, I, I mean, I think we're at a pivotal moment in human civilization. And, and I think we have, you know, most of us are asleep to this big reality. The United Nations has set forth these 10 great millennium goals. But if we really look at the millennium goals, behind them, behind each one, is, it, is an attempt to fix a crisis. Whether it's refugees or water, desertification, all of the, all of the issues that they've outlined ultimately boil down to soil. So they're, they're very much trying to put a Band-Aid on each of these things, and not to go against the United Nations. There's a World Soil Day, which is great, so they do celebrate soil. But if you truly look at the culmination of these things, fast forward, I don't know, let's say to 2050, 10 billion human beings uh, is what they tell us we'll have. The prediction is a billion refugees, a billion refugees, mostly from soil desertification meaning areas that cannot, can no longer produce food. We don't have the infrastructure. We do not have the wherewithal. We physically, as a, as a planet, we can't deal with a billion people who don't have homes. Never mind the climatological implications of mass desertification because we've lost 
a third of our farmable land since the late 1970s, just blown through it. And, and, and really, if you look at the, the history of industrial agriculture over the past 100, 150 years, we've essentially, we've got two thirds of the land mass of the world is desertified. That's a shocking number. So I think we, we stand at the precipice of two trajectories. On one trajectory, we fail to recognize these warning signs and we keep trying to put some kind of political band-aid over them. Uh, and we're going to end up with some very dire circumstances in a very short period of time. I live in Southern California. We just saw the largest wildfire in the nation's history. Uh, is Southern California, is it, does it naturally burn? Yes. Does it naturally have mudslides? Sure. Does Houston naturally have tornadoes? Yes. But we're not talking about the natural occurrence. We're talking about scale and scope increasing. And over time, we see the scale and scope of these things radically, exponentially increasing to the point where human infrastructure can't deal with them. So more food for more people is needed, not less land and more people. And we're on the less land and more people trajectory. So I think we either embrace that kind of apocalyptic future or we go, hey, hang on. We're, you know, humans are pretty smart monkeys. We've developed a lot of technology. We've made a lot of great strides and great changes. Let's radically alter our course. Let's care for the world's soils. Let's take the two thirds of the world that's desertifying, that's turning into desert, that's literally turning into sand, a dust, and let's regenerate it. Let's bring it back. Let's regenerate those soils. Let's create carbon dense, water rich soils uh, and balance tremendous parts of the ecosystem, rebalance parts of the climate. That's where I think we need to go as a species. The question is, which road are we going to take? Right. So you talk about uh, conscious capitalism. What, what do you see as conscious capitalism? Well, I, I think we have to talk about unconscious capitalism first, because that's what we're doing as a society today. If you look at what is economics founded on, it's founded on you know, the principles that Adam Smith put forward. And there are, there are some fundamental misconceptions or untruths in what Adam Smith wrote many, many, many years ago. And, and one of the fundamental misunderstandings of the physical world is that you know, the whole economic theory that we have today is based on, is predicated on limitless growth. Limitless growth requires limitless resources. Limitless resources would mean limitless oil, limitless aluminum, limitless gold, limitless all the terrestrial, the earthbound resources that are not in fact limitless, they're assumed to be limitless. And so when you look at that economic construction that we're living in, which is just an infinite amount of consumption, and you're okay, well, let's accelerate this. Let's add two or three billion more people to this and exponentially reduce our resources. You know, this system is clearly set up to fail. It's clearly set up for short-term gain for a number of people, certainly not all people. So the question becomes, what is a system that will work? How do we not have this win-lose game that we've been playing for thousands of years? How do we play a different game on planet Earth? And the answer to that question in the 60s and 70s began to be sustainability. Can we just sustain things? Can we, can, can we create a sustenance that will maintain everything? Um, but that doesn't work for a growing population. You don't want to sustain a degraded planet, a degraded biosphere, a degraded set of resources. So really kiss the ground, the book and the movement, the regenerative agriculture movement, which is turning into regenerative lifestyle, uh, it aims to disrupt those theories, and it aims to put forward a new theory called, can you, wherever you live, whatever agriculture you perform, agriculture being the basis of society, the basis of civilization, can you increase the base resource? Can you increase the water holding of soil? 
Can you increase carbon density in soil? Can you increase soil itself, soil being the fundamental you know, foundation of society? Can you increase that fundamental bank account from which humans draw? And we believe the answer is yes, those of us in the movement. I believe after having studied it, having written the book, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and that is a different model. It, 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 it will, if it succeeds, ripple throughout capitalism. I think we're about to see a massive disruption in the next 10 to 15 years of what we currently think of as capitalism. And that, that, that goes into the blockchain, it goes into many things that we're seeing. Uh, but the philosophy, the basic underlying philosophy, ultimately has to be regenerative. It has to be making things better. So Josh, um, I was discussing this in, in, in our current system, uh, we, we all work for money and seem to, that's, that's the end goal of all the games. But in a regenerative system, uh, it really turns into being soil, does it not? And this is soil that, that really provides for all. That's a great question. This is the, another fundamental misunderstanding of economics. We often think, well, society is based on gold or it's based on some fixed thing for which we have attributed a value. But look at the 20 civilizations, minimum 20 civilizations that have risen and fallen. They didn't fall due to a lack of money. They fell due to a lack of soil. The fundamental resource to grow food, which is the basis of civilization, when that becomes scarce, not, it's not, um, oh, we couldn't make more lithium ion batteries. Uh, oh, geez, we couldn't burn more fossil fuels. No, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the linchpin that took down these very advanced civilizations. The linchpin was we had to go further and further and further and further away from population centers to get to healthy soils to grow food to sustain our populations. And as those chains got more and more fragile, the ability to sustain that population got less and less and less. So there's nowhere left to go, unfortunately, on planet Earth. We have now inhabited the planet. There's no other place with healthier soils. Um, although we're trying to do that in the Amazon to some degree. Bad idea. The lungs, of, the lungs of the planet. So, you know, we've really run out of that. That game is over. So, yes, soil is the basis of civilization. Not gold, not money, not oil. It's soil. All right. Um, so having established that, and I, I, I agree totally, you have um, in the book visited some interesting farmers, one of them being Gabe Brown, who has uh, shown how this can be done on a large scale. Gabe's got a couple thousand acres and, and uh, tell us um, what, what you liked, you, what you saw at Gabe's place and what you liked. Yeah. Well, I featured Gabe in the book and, you know, there's a documentary that will come out, I promise, at some stage. Um, because, you know, I visited a lot of farmers who are practicing regenerative practices, but Gabe is, is very articulate. So he can show you, he can tell you, he can explain it, and it's, <laughs> it's a one-stop shop to understand what's going on. He's not the only one that's doing it, but he is perhaps one of the most able to fully describe what is happening on a meta level. Um, his farm's about 5,000 acres. And I think the, the biggest thing to realize about farming today, in the United States, farm debt is doing this. Farm debt's going right up. Farm income is doing this. And I was just on a radio show in Minnesota, um, and there was a, a gentleman who called in. He said, look, this is just a short-term fluctuation due to low market prices for commodities. And I said, do you consider short-term since the late 1960s, early 1970s? Because we've had falling market prices for commodities for yeah, the better part of 40, 50 years now. What is short-term? At what point do we go, this system is absolutely insane. 
it's literally putting farmers out of work. Um, and, and I think that's the, you know, if I was in charge of the USDA, that economic chart, which is available from the USDA information, that would be on the front page of every report. Here's how we're doing. Farm debt, farm income. That means that farmers are going out of work. They're going out of business. Um, meanwhile, we subsidize the commodity crops, as you, as you well know, through a very complex system. Uh, and so 80% of our farmland is dedicated to corn, soy, hay, and wheat which creates a nutritional void in the American diet. So you know, there's nothing about that system that works for the majority of farmers or the majority of Americans. Uh, and people say, well, it's a, you know, farmers are getting very rich and you know, yeah, there is a consolidation because to survive, you have to get bigger. That's how the game is working. Um, Gabe's kind of the opposite. He's 5,000 acres, that's twice the size of the average American farm in the US. He's making, profit-wise, about $100 an acre. That's, you know, compared to the average US farm, according to the USDA, which is making between 25 cents an acre and $2 an acre. So right there, before you even get into regenerative agriculture, there's your numbers. It's scale and it's profitable. Um, and, as Gabe tells it, you know, he gives these lectures all around the country, but farmers don't often shift in droves because of the commodity crop insurance that they get for their commodity crops. Gabe practices a stacked system of enterprises. So he's got the cover crop, then he grows on the same land, the cash crop. He's also got animal grazing that he'll use those same acres on, and he's got different types of animals that walk through it. So he's got multiple animals, then he's got animal byproducts, like he actually grows feed for other farms, he grows honey. So, you know, on one acre, instead of growing corn, which is the most common crop in the US, he's got all these different enterprises and each one is an income stream. And each one is used to pump carbon through the system, cycle it into the soil and build the soil depth. So he's making all this money while he's building the soil profile. That's incredible. You know, when, when, when I was working with USDA, I had pretty much been taught in a very conventional college of agriculture and I had adopted very mainstream ideas. I valued the fact that I tried to look at both sides and, and saw both the industrial and the more organic kinds of systems. But, uh, but you hit on many points there that, that just really opened my eyes. I think for me, when I started seeing what microbial populations are doing in the soil and this whole plant microbe interface, which was kind of my research area, you, you become overwhelmed with time, recognizing that these microbes are doing absolutely everything that we purchase and apply chemicals to achieve, but they're doing it faster and they reproduce, so you don't need to keep applying. And when you apply the chemicals, you, you eliminate this microbial interface. So now you have a chemically dependent soil. And as I thought about this, I went back to very old research, stuff that agricultural scientists were doing in the late 1800s, very early 1900s. And you just described what people were doing. We had very diversified, very integrated systems where one layer of the ecosystem replenished the other layer. And so it was this diversity that keeps the system going. And somehow in our industrial model, when we learned how to make uh, model T's on the assembly line, we tried to turn that into food and food doesn't work that way. Uh, we need that diversity, we need that complexity to keep a farm system working and also to keep an economic system working because it's all those little income streams that keep markets centered around the small, if, if you don't have small businesses in a town, you're not gonna have small local farmers. Yeah. And, and we need that diversity in all sectors to keep the system sustainable. 
And that, you know, I think, I think what you said is really important in that we are seeing a, you know, the United States has one of the worst qualities of life in the Western world, medically speaking, health speaking, nutritional speaking. Uh, we have the most work hours in the Western world. So you know, young people who have the opportunity to sort of choose where they're going to live, many of them would like to live not in a dense urban center. They want to be out in America. Uh, but if you look at the small towns that were supported by agrarian enterprise, those small towns are literally becoming dust. And so, you know, I think, I think we have to really seriously think about like what kind of future do we want? And, and this is a great opportunity for, for young people. We've got, we've got the opportunity to create a, instead of a, what is today a $25 billion cost to taxpayers via farm subsidies that we pay as taxpayers, we've got the ability to create a $90, $90 billion income stream $90 billion positive industry. What would $90 billion look like in rural America? I mean, it would, it would radically change this country. It would radically change the opportunity to live, you know, in what is currently becoming ghost towns. Um, the quality of life would be much better for many people. So, so that's, the, that's the big opportunity, I think, on a, on a big level. I wanted to share, let me see if I can share a couple of slides. Let me see if this will work. Conventional so, versus regenerative ag. Yeah, a couple of keys, and, and this is developed by the Kiss the Ground nonprofit. But just really simple, people go, well, what's the difference? Um, and this shows a really simple difference is conventional agriculture, the flyover states when you fly over in a plane, you're seeing a lot of bare soil across America. Regenerative agriculture keeps the land covered. It keeps the cover crops going in between cash crops. Pretty simple. That draws down CO2, it draws down water. Um, again, conventional agriculture relies very heavily on tillage. Regenerative agriculture uses devices like things like the no-till drill, which is a device sold by John Deere. It's very similar to a disker. It looks like a disker, but it just creates a slit in the soil instead of churning up the soil. It allows things to continue to grow. That helps keep cover on the soil. And really one of the biggest differences is how animals are dealt with. We had about 60 million bison when Europeans came to the US. Bison are herbivores, they're ruminants. Today we have about 60 million cattle. Cattle are ruminants, they're herbivores. So it's not the animals that we are um, engaged with, it's how we're managing them that is so deleterious to the environment and so deleterious to their health and our health. So using planned grazing or plant mob grazing, different terms for it, but moving animals across a landscape once a day. Those are some of the basic tenets. And really, when we look at what are the benefits? Um, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. You've got more profitable farming operations. You've got, a, you've got farmers engaged in helping to balance CO2. Some people would say that's the biggest challenge of our generation. You're reversing desertification. You're creating ecosystems. And uh, you're, you're in a roundabout way. You are able to, to take place in stabilizing uh, the oceanic level of oxygen, which is going down uh, because we're increasing CO2 so much. So, you know, a lot of benefits to regenerative agriculture. A lot, a lot of benefits. Absolutely. Well, Josh, I, I really appreciate you sharing all this today. Um, I understand you're making a movie out of the book. Uh, True. Is how far along? When will that be out? Uh, very far along. We're hoping it'll be out soon. Okay. This, this year. This year. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, you know, folks can see the trailer to the book. Uh, the trailer, sorry. People can see the trailer to the movie on the book website. So that's 
a look there at the book website. You can just go to kissthegroundbook.com, have a look at the movie trailer, uh, get, get excited, get your copy of the book, and share this information. We want to create a million peaceful soil warriors to get this information out. That's the goal. You know, you brought up the, uh, the opportunities for young people. And I tried, to, when I talked to the schools about some of this, to, to bring up the fact that, you know, the average age of farmers in the country is 60 or above. And uh, people still need to eat. Mm. So, so there's a lot of opportunity for young people to get involved in things that are going to help rebuild the soil, to rebuild the opportunities for local farms and farms in their communities. And uh, depending on the way they go about it, it can be a very productive and rewarding lifestyle. Uh, they don't have to get into this debt-ridden cycle that comes with the subsidized ag and the, and the big machinery, the big equipment, and this kind of thing. So I will sh make sure they see your book. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mary.